Okay, so um, I actually this this is a um, not well polished revision of a lecture that I actually had in previous semesters. So this is uh, the first semester that I'm actually giving you this uh, video from me. Um, and so I'm actually I want to apologize. It's not going to be the most uh, exciting presentation. I'm going to do a lot of reading actually from. Um, basically a, a book that I'm writing on this topic now. So what I ended up realizing is that I've been writing a lot on the subject of uh, much of the material that we're covering uh, here right now. And I've had to polish up some things that I said before and actually maybe even uh, correct a little bit. And um, uh, it is a very confusing section and we're covering a lot because uh, um, in this case, I'm, this is a cram course. In future classes, this actually may not be a cram course and it won't be as overwhelming. Um, but uh, what I want to do is I'm going to read to you. Um, I'm, I'm try Hopefully, this will be seen as nuanced. But I'm going to read to you partly of what I wrote. Uh, this, is, um, this is coming from what I've been writing and trying to condense and break down socialism, capitalism, liberalism, and communism. And I'm also going to talk about anarchism a little bit here, but this is mainly going to be focused on socialism and communism and the difference. Um, so first of all, what I need to say and what you're seeing me show in the other videos is that modern discourse and the way that these words have evolved confuses things. So we have in Spain a socialist party in power, but is Spain socialist? And are socialist parties that mainly exist in Europe uh, that's ha that's had had a long tradition at, at this point of being in politics um, are they com like what is their platform are they committed to the same thing so what we're already learning is that liberalism and conservatism have have been evolving and changing depending on where they're located in time and what country um, so, uh, and, and that's what I'm having you see, uh, what you look at, uh, just even in our readings about the way Australia still uses the word liberal at, in, in more of the classical sense. Um, <clears throat> so, um, sometimes, you know, when people talk about being into socialism and they say, well, give me a definition of it. Um, this is a challenge because of the way that things are articulated now. So for the sake of this class, let's try to conceptualize, get a handle on what the textbook says and what uh, some things that are mentioned here to understand about their original intent and then from that point on when you look at anybody who says that they're a democratic socialist now that they're a liberal or a conservative um you know make sure that you're um aware of the classic definition but also of how like you, you know, might want to explore with that person or that party or this uh, uh, what do those terms mean in, towards, in regards to what they stand for now? And that's really important, I think, in helping out with this topic. So, um, so in uh, what I write here is that socialism is a concept origi originating in the 18th century France, but some historians place it uh, earlier. Most agree, though, that it's 19th century where it really has its popularity uh, soaring um, and it becomes more significant. So socialism was a reaction against the individualism celebrated by economically successful people during the Industrial Revolution. The ideology of socialists was, the hu was that humans should develop an economy for society as a whole. They were opposed to the individualist business model that neglects mass uh, wealth disparity and creates inequality as reflected in capitalism. In its purest utopian definition, utopian meaning in its ideal world, its 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 vision, uh, 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 its pie in the sky. Some people say a derogatory uh, in a derogatory sense, but um, its definition is that the goal for workers was to take direct control of the means of production. In other words, the workers would control everything. Now that is the sort, of, I guess you could say, classic definition of socialism. But you're going to see that many people who identify as socialists now don't hold to that at all so that's something i always want to remind you of but but that's what we're talking about around this time period um and so uh, uh then you have capitalism so what would we define as capitalism uh it's an economic system which facilitates profits to be made by the private sector uh, uh to own the means of production such as business or property 
Individuals can create wealth and drastically alleviate their material conditions. Capitalism has been celebrated for creating vast amount of consumer goods enjoyed by everyone. Ideally, prices can be kept low and goods accessible if there is an abundance of competition between capitalists and little government regulation. That's, that's the, how it works in theory. Capitalism is viewed as a requirement for greater freedoms because it allows for individual economic dependence and political liberty not attached to the state. Capitalism was originally defined as a complement to liberalism with the assumption that limited government, economic freedom, and political freedom go hand in hand. But then I write this, but capitalism is an amoral system, not immoral. Amoral means it has no morals, It okay, uh, an outside of profit making. Now that is, that makes sense, right? Because capitalism is not a person. It's a system and it's, it's not evil and it's not good uh, in terms of its goals. Its goals is to make profit. Now, generating profit can create good things, but also if one just focuses on profit, that can produce bad things. So you can see how, how uh, um, um, capitalism can become moralized, you know, by its supporters or it can, you know, are looked down upon by, uh, it's just, you know, people crit critical of it based on the outcomes of the profit-based system. So workers and the, and the environment, uh, in this case, though, would be mere tools. So even nationalism is of secondary importance uh, to capitalism. Now that, some people disagree, but, but actually populist uh, ideologies, I mean, let's just take, for instance, and I'm not mentioning this to go into the whole entire topic of Trump, some, you know, to push back on certain economic things um, the way he did to be more pro-American. I mean, a lot of people don't realize if you just made everything in America, it might not be the best economic choice, but it would be a good nationalist choice for people who value nationalism, right? Um, so if you're strictly into the end results of profit making and how that works, a lot of times nationalism <clears throat> is actually going to be at odds with capitalism. And uh, that's something that a lot of people actually overlook. And um, I'll try to get to that a little bit more uh, later. So um, what are important socialist activities? Uh, creating labor unions, uh, fighting by any means at times, enforceable workers' rights, and improving workers' conditions within a capitalist society. Some socialists have actually called for the abolition of capitalism entirely. That's also what you really saw, especially in the 19th century. And one robust revolutionary anti-capitalist branch is going to be communism. Now, uh, Warren Lerner, uh, a, a, a historian of social, socialism and communism in modern times, points out something. Every communist is a socialist, but not every socialist is a communist. Now, what does that mean? Well, communists <clears throat> believe that history comes in stages. The first would be to create a socialist state, and eventually you will have a, a their utopianism would be a communist state where the state withers away and everybody has everything uh, in common. Okay, so it, it believes in stages and it has a more uh, kind of utopian uh, end to it. The anarchists originally... You know, there, there, there was a guy named Mikhail Bakunin, a, a Russian, that actually worked with Karl Marx. And he even translated the Communist Manifesto into Russian. But he thought, just as many anarchists still do, that the workers should smash the state, get rid of it, and go straight into uh, a socialist uh, or a communist, actually, type of utopia. While Marx thought that workers should take it over and make it a worker state. Well, obviously for an anarchist, this is just as bad as anything. I mean, a worker, st a state is a state it's a, and, and it's not acceptable. And they violently uh, didn't actually fist fight, but uh, my understanding is it was kind of close to that. It was, and, and historically anarchists and communists have been allies on the same I issues and also actually at odds, especially during the Cold War. Um, and, and, and actually violent ways because of this difference of the idea of the state. In other words, how do we get to this com commune, uh, communist 
uh, utopia uh, um, or something that would even be defined as that, okay? Now, Karl Marx, uh, uh, he was a German thinker and he had a patron and friend named Frederick Engels and they put together the Communist uh, Manifesto in 1848 and they really made a, a, a sort of unique, very highly thought out form of, of communism where um, they outlined a history. So for Marx, global conditions of oppressor and oppressed is the main driving force of history. And these relations of class conflict become set up regarding the economic and technological circumstances of each historical epoch. Emerging out of a revolution against feudalism, the merchants broke free and created a successful advanced capitalist market society, such as you, you would see in the French Revolution. Um, but the owner's goal, okay, in Marxist theory, is to point out, is to dominate capitalist society and to maximize profits. That means paying the workers as little as possible, while the worker's goal is to get the highest pay as possible. This logic also applied to those who own property. So the landowner's goal is to extract as much money as they can from rents, and the renter's goal is to attain the most affordable quality housing. For Marx, conflict of interest between those that own business, the means of production, uh, who he called the bourgeoisie, okay, and the how, uh, versus the majority of workers, uh, um, is something that was not going to be able to get resolved, and he calls it that the proletariat. So the the workers are the proletariat, and the capitalists are the bourgeoisie, um, and so. Um, and then he actually called this scientific socialism because he thought that he, that he was able to analyze history and the forces of history. For instance, the conflict it gets generated uh, uh, um, and the movement of history uh, in, in a way that's similar to evolution and Darwin. Um, and so uh, this is actually what gets defined, uh, this type of communism is Marxism. And eventually it's going to be the Russians that actually are the first nation to attempt to implement these ideas into action. And so um, that's the main ideas to point out. So uh, uh, briefly, without going too much longer in this video. Um, um, so you're seeing that, that Marx has a complex set of ideas. And you'll notice, actually, Marx sees capitalism as progressive, which a lot of people are surprised to learn about. It's just that Marx felt, Marx felt that capitalists actually make sense. They are going to protect their interests. If you own a business and you own property, you're just going to do that. And you're going to do it. Your, your own interests are going to, it's logical that you're going to defend your interests. And it's logical for the worker who is getting screwed in their mind uh, in the arrangement to resist that. And so... For Marx, it's not that he feels like he's generating the conflict. It's the system itself it's that, that actually generates the conflict and that the inevitable collapse of, 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 of capitalism isn't something that revolutionaries are responsible for. It's, 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 it's like, again, it's the system itself. It is, it is going to happen this way. Um, and he sees this very confidently in the way that a Christian would say that Jesus is coming, the rapture is coming. Or a Muslim would say, Yawmuddin, the, the judgment day will come. It's not if, it's when. Okay? Um, it's very confident. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, but now, of course, how modern Marxists have been able to deal with this and the end results of the Soviet Union, this is a whole other topic. Um, and the state of, 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 when you see China now, keep in mind that things are very different. I mean, they have, they've been integrated into global capitalist society. How is that? Why? What do we make of China? What do we make of all of this, uh, of, of, of Marxism now in a, in a, in a somewhat post-Soviet world? Um, I'm not going to cover that here. Um, if any of you want to uh, contact me to go over that in more detail, I, I will try. I, I will cover a little more of that and get into that just as we get to the end of this uh, semester because that really is helpful in understanding the state of the world that exists now. I also then want to point out that um, you know you're going to see that socialist and communist parties within Western Europe mainly um, 
participate in, polit- in politics and, 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 and basically they run for elections and they lose elections and they concede. Um, and so uh, they're not viewed as radical within the Western and Northern European context as they are. It is to be that way in the United States. So the United States, uh, we are, we're, every time that there's some sort of conspiracy, uh, it's often portrayed as communist. But the irony is, is that the United States is the least socialist uh, out of Western nations compared to uh, Western Europe. Um, that was very clear to me too when I was three months in, in, uh, in Europe uh, just a few years ago. And uh, that's understood by most Europeans. So it's, it's, it's always kind of interesting to me that we have a certain political branch that's always fearing this looming communism and socialism in the United States when in fact we have always been and are definitely the least socialist on so many levels. We have the smallest amount of union membership we don't have universal health care, which every European nation has. Uh, Germany has had since the 19th century, um, and uh, so on. Now, what we're often seeing people confuse is authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is simply associated with many in modern political discourse as being communism, socialism, or some people say fascism. And fascism is another topic we're going to get to later. So just keep in mind, modern discourse really muddles up a lot of the, the historical meanings and um, it's okay to be confused because the original meanings and to what we're getting now has made it very confusing. And so I'm hoping that this is going to help clear up a few things for you.